Shared reading is typically synonymous with teaching in kindergarten, first, and or even second grade. But the reality is, is that it is incredibly beneficial for upper grades when it comes to improving comprehension and the overall reading fluency of your students. So in this video, I'm breaking down the what, why, and how of shared reading instruction for upper elementary teachers. So what is shared reading? Well, it's an instructional strategy that makes reading collaborative between both the teacher and the students. It is exactly what the name entails. It is a shared reading experience. But the challenge that so many teachers struggle with is what is happening between the student and the teachers in order to make this experience meaningful. To understand this better, let's break this down by looking at the roles of the teacher and the students. In shared reading, the teacher is guiding students to think about specific comprehension questions and to really help model fluency and expression. This process really helps students with thinking so that they can better understand what is happening inside of a text. After all, we can't analyze, we can't write about unless we understand what's happening within our text and stories. And then students are really just engaging with the text by responding to those questions, asking their own questions and practicing their own fluency. So when you really think about it, teachers need to be working or talking around 60 to 70% of the time and students need to be engaging with the text and the teacher the other 30 to 40% of that time. Here's the key, is that the instruction itself is still very much teacher directed, but it gets the students involved with the process rather than them just sitting there and listening the teacher like in a Charlie Brown episode. Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> So it's a very much a directive process with the teachers and students are really getting involved with the reading and the discussion of the text to really help them process through that information. And so there's so many different benefits when it comes to this entire process. And I will be very honest with you guys, I've been using this my entire career from when I taught kindergarten all the way when I taught to sixth grade. So this is a very much a possibility and it does not have to feel babyish in sixth grade at all. So let's talk about some of these benefits when it comes to shared reading. It's really just about supporting literacy with your students. And again, it can happen in sixth grade. So one of the benefits is that it provides students with that continued embedded phonics instruction and fluency practice. I had a class in one year where phonics instruction and fluency was a really big challenge for the majority of students. And so I had to make an instructional adjustment to the core of what I was teaching and started really embedding a lot more of that phonics and fluency practice into my many lessons. I knew that I just couldn't rely on small group. I needed to have both times because they needed multiple exposures and opportunities for that practice. So it does really allow for you to build in some of those embedded phonics skills. The other area that it helps is that it provides opportunities for just building vocabulary and overall comprehension. This helps to inform students about what are the meanings of words? How does this look within a text? What does it actually mean? How do we know that this word means this? And so you're building in a lot of these conversations to get them understanding what the story is all about. This also really helps to promote that oral language development in our students. And they have that opportunity to hear that rich vocabulary, engage in some of those questions and ask questions about the text that they might have. And so they're learning how to be able to articulate themselves, articulate their thinking and be able to process it. And it is a very, very important skill. So not only do we need to practice oral language when it comes to just 
those everyday conversations that we might have with friends or families, but we also have to engage in practicing that oral language skills when it comes to how does this look in more of a professional setting and more of an academic setting? Because that does look different and we have to help our students understand the differences between those. It also allows students to just enjoy the material that they may not be able to read on their own. And so we know that this is a time to really help students understand that there are so many other different topics out there. And one of the challenges that we have is really helping our kids see it. I mean, how many times have we read the exact same text over and over and over again? And they're probably hearing about those same exact topics in first grade, in kindergarten, in sixth grade. And so we wanna open this world of information information and different interests so that we can help to hook those kids in and show them that there are other topics that they might be interested in. And finally, it's all about making sure that your students feel successful and providing support to all learners. And that is the key here, that when we're doing our mini lessons, we want to make sure that we are really targeting and engaging all students, not just one student or two students, not just our high kids who understand what's happening in our lesson, but making sure that we're tailoring it in a way that we're helping every student feel successful, make sure that they're feeling as though that they are engaged and part of that learning process, even if they're not as likely to raise their hand and try to answer a question one-on-one. -on -one. And so we're gonna talk about what some of these strategies look like as we start to shift in, how do we start to implement shared reading strategies into our mini lessons? Now let's take a look into these strategies and how we plan on using them during our specific lessons. And I'm gonna tell you, based on my experience and just trials and errors when it comes to shared reading, I am just sharing some of the tips that have really worked best for my own specific classroom and my own teaching style. So as always, you might need to adapt a few of these to fit the needs of your students, but still there's gonna be a lot of great considerations and tips that you might be able to take back and immediately start to implement into your own classroom. Now, for starters, when you go to look up shared reading, a lot of the time you're gonna say, you're gonna see things that say big books. I do not use big books <laughs> in my upper elementary classrooms. And so you're gonna find a lot of people saying, oh, we'll have big books when it comes to shared reading. Instead, I'm gonna be very honest, I use smaller text that I can just either put onto my view board or have it projected up on a projector or maybe even using an iPad if you have some form of like an Apple Play that you can be able to use. My favorite has been using the view board and also my iPad where I can easily annotate, circle things that I really want my students to be able to focus on. So, I will say that there are times when I will use these strategies when it comes to any form of like a picture book. So we're reading a picture book with my students and I want them to be able to um, read it with me or go through any of these shared reading strategies. You might need to take pictures of specific pages and project them up if you want them to practice fluency and expression. And that is just because you want students to be able to see it. Um, so you can either take pictures, project it, you can print out a picture, maybe one to two pages front and back that you want them to have specifically at their um, laps whenever you're doing your lesson, or it could be something as simple as just a task card, which I started using, utilizing a lot of task cards to get them practicing a lot more with these shared reading strategies because I wanted to provide feedback to them as we were going through a specific lesson. And really, it just helps to scaffold this process for them when it comes to any strategy or skill that you're wanting to embed into your instruction. The key here is that you're bringing in grade level text that can, that you're gonna be supporting students while reading, okay? That's the entire purpose of this. So here are my suggestions when it comes to supporting your students in shared reading. And 
Here's the key, make it simple. <laughs> it's gonna make it so simple, in fact, that when you're planning, you don't really have to put in a ton of effort when it comes to creating your lesson plans because the process itself is so simple that I feel like sometimes we make it incredibly complicated. So here's the thing that I would first say to you, and this is your first tip have a text that your students can see. And then better yet, going back to what I mentioned earlier, give them a copy of it if you are able to do so. Now, keep in mind that this does not need to be an entire text that you're doing this with your students, okay? It can be a very small portion of the text. So again, if you're printing out a page from a picture book, you're only printing out maybe a couple of pages. If you're really wanting to focus and target in that instruction, only focus it on one little area, have that projected up here on your board so that you can incorporate some of these shared reading strategies. But it does not have to be the whole book because if you're doing the entire book, you're gonna have students who start to get antsy, they start to get over it, and they all wanna get up and just move on. So keep it snappy, be very intentional and focused when it comes to how you're selecting those texts. So I've used picture books in the past where I've taken a couple of pictures, put them up. I've also used task cards. I've also used short stories. So anything that, they, that you can print and you can hand it out to students. And sometimes I will do a lot of the reading and they're only going to be answering questions. And then other times we're reading back and forth as well, which we're gonna get into in just a minute. Tip number two, which kind of goes with tip number one, is that you want to keep your text short and intentional, as I just mentioned. And the reason for this, again, is that your kids are going to get antsy. You want to keep them engaged. And if you have a longer text, like a really long picture book, then they're not going to get focused and you're going to lose the meaning of a lesson. So keep it very meaningful and to a very small portion of the text to incorporate some of these shared reading strategies. The third tip I have for you is to read the text with your students, not to your students. Now there are going to be some occasions where you are going to be doing a little bit more of the reading because remember, if we go back to that percentage, you're doing about 60 to 70% of the talking where then students are kind of working about in that 30 to 40 range. So it's still very teacher directed, but if I'm doing a lot of the reading, I'm going to build in more strategies um, to get my kids thinking about questions. So when we're talking about reading the text, with your students, here are some of the options. The first one is going to be an echo read. So your voices are going to join in to read a text together. So here's what I mean by this. I would read a sentence. Polar bears are magnificent creatures that live in the cold and icy regions of the Arctic. The point there is that I've modeled fluency I've shown them how to read that, and now they're going to echo read that with me. And then I would say, all right, your turn, ready? Here we go. Polar bears are magnificent creatures that live in the cold and icy regions of the Arctic. Now, one of the things that I don't know if you picked up on is that when I go to do the echo, obviously there are no kids here, so that makes it a little bit challenging, but when I go to do the echo reading, my voice, drops. I'm still reading it with them. However, I drop the level of my voice. I don't talk as in my normal teacher voice with my students because I still want to have them modeling and practicing that fluency and it supports them in that reading process overall. So that's the first strategy that you can use. The next one is one of my favorites. It's a close reading strategy. Close, C-L-O-Z-E, close. And with a closed reading strategy, what you're doing is you're omitting words as you read. And so you would stop at words to have your students pick up on it. Now, in this one, you want to be very intentional. And this is where the phonics embedded practice comes into play. So let's say I'm looking at this text and I'm like, oh, I want my students to practice um, maybe something when it comes to our controlled vowels. Okay, so I would identify any type of R control vowels and be able to pull those out ahead of time. And that's really what I want my students to target. You could also 
have students really focus in on key words that you want them to remember. So let's go back to the R controlled vowel. If I'm looking at that first sentence again, I might say, okay, you're gonna start, ready? First word, bears are magnificent that live in the cold and icy of the so all I did is stop and as I'm pointing to the words, students are picking up where they need to chime in. Now you have to be very meaningful with them and say you're only doing one word. Don't try to keep reading. And so it will take a little bit of practice, especially if your students have never been familiar with this strategy, but this is one that they really do enjoy. And so I picked out words that I really wanted students to practice, but maybe I want them to focus in on specific areas. So if I'm looking at the next sentence that I have here, these amazing animals are the largest land carnivores and their fur is not white, but actually transparent. So when I go to do my close reading, I want them to pick up on this section here that they're the largest, that they're carnivores, and that they are transparent, okay? And so as I would read, because those are things that I want characteristics I want them picking up on, because hint here, the strategy is descriptive uh, text, like text structures. So I want them to be able to pull up on those descriptive words, and that's gonna be the words that I want them reading, because this is where they're gonna remember it the most. So then as I go through, I'm just gonna pause. These animals, uh, these amazing animals are the, and then they would say largest, land, and their fur is not white, but actually, and then you can have a conversation about it. So this one is really nice, but again, it's about being intentional with how you're having your students fill in those words rather than just having them fill it in just for the sake of filling it in, because that doesn't make it meaningful for them. The next one that we're gonna talk about is a choral reading. And this is where everybody together, we're all reading it together. And I would just say, okay, guys, we're gonna read uh, together starting from this sentence. And again, you can mix and match these and then have it interwoven throughout. And so while I was reading this, I might use two or three strategies and that's totally fine because it's gonna keep them engaged. It's gonna keep the pacing moving and students are gonna be really focused in on what they're doing, right? So now I might say, we're gonna read this next sentence together. Here we go, ready? Underneath their skin is black, which helps them soak up the warmth from the sun. Reading it all together, practicing that fluency, but be intentional with the sentence you want them to read and making sure that the readability is there. If it's gonna be a sentence that has some more challenging text, then obviously you wouldn't want your students to be choral reading that because they're gonna struggle. So make sure by reading this ahead and thinking, okay, maybe underneath is gonna to be too hard, Maybe they do know it, but if that word's too hard, then maybe that sentence isn't something that I wanna choral read with my students. And so it's important to just take those into consideration as you start to plan these out. And so what you could do is as you are looking at text and you're starting to plan out some of these strategies, I might say that, oh, for this very first part, we're gonna echo read that sentence. For this next one, I'm gonna do a close. So I'm gonna mark it with a Z. And then as a teacher, I know for this next one, we're gonna choral read this together. I'm gonna mark that with a C. And so what that does is it helps me annotate and know exactly what strategies I'm gonna be using and where so I don't have to be thinking about it during my lesson. The last strategy that I have for you is one where you can take the picture book and have a printed out page, maybe one to two pages front and back. You don't wanna do any more than that. And you wanna incorporate maybe a partner reading activity. And this is where you are very intentional about where you have students sitting. Now, I did a video where I talked a lot about active engagement, getting your students engaged, and I talked about partnering your students and being intentional with it. I'm gonna be sure to link that video. So if you haven't checked it out already, definitely go and look at that video because it helps to support the work that you're gonna do here. So I'm gonna be very intentional with where I have my students uh, seated at 
the meeting area and I would give them a text and they're gonna partner read. And during this partner read, you're gonna just say, it's gonna be one sentence for each person. So you're gonna just go to teeter totter back and forth and that's fine. Or if you have two pages, maybe one partner reads one side, the other partner reads the other side. The key is, is that you want to be very specific with who's going to be reading first and how much are they gonna be reading? Because if not, you're gonna be putting out fires the entire time, you're gonna have students arguing and that is not something that you want to happen. So be very intentional when it comes to how you are partnering up your students. You could also give them the task card and then say, you know what, for the rest of the text, I want you guys to partner up with the person next to you and you're gonna partner read the last few sentences of, um, of the text. And maybe it's that they're also doing a choral read together, both as partners, but they're reading it together with the person that they're sat next to. Here's one thing that I really want to uh, make a point of, <laughs> and I really want you listening to this. We are not having students round robin read. Do not have your students round robin read. And what round robin is, is in case you are not familiar with it, is where every student reads a sentence or a section and they're just going in a circle and everybody's reading. As someone who, when I was younger, had to do round robin reading, I hated it. I wasn't even listening to what everybody else was doing. You know what I was paying attention to? I was rereading the line that I had to read over and over and over and over and over again so that when I got to me, I didn't screw up in front of everybody. So please do not have your students round robin read. It is not purposeful, it is not meaningful, and it only stresses students out at the very end of the day. So build in some of these other collaborative um, activities and the ways that I've just modeled it for you here into your lessons. Tip number four is to be intentional with what you have students read. And I know I've already spoken about it, but I think it deserves its own tip by itself. And it's to make these sections very, very meaningful. You want to build in active engagement. And again, I have that video for you to go and check out. And I'm going to talk a little bit more in other videos about active engagement and what that's supposed to look like inside of your classroom. But you want to make sure you're targeting all students. So in this case, when we're echo reading, we're all echo reading. If we're doing a close and they're reading uh, with specific words, they're all reading those specific words. When we're choral reading, everybody's reading together. And then when I have them doing things with partners or I have them answering questions, we're doing it all together. And that is really important. And so you want to really think about asking those right questions to get everybody engaged. And one of the types of questions that you can ask about is basically a closed question, right? Um, I might say, um, okay guys, their fur is not white, it's actually everyone. And everybody would say transparent. Everybody is engaged and we're all getting that retrieval practice in order to remember the things that we're reading, which is the key here. So you can have those questions where everybody's answering the same thing, but when you're doing that, making sure that it's a word or phrase that everybody already knows. When it's something that has more input and more um, individualism when it comes to their responses, you're gonna build in more partner practice with that. The other thing that I really want you to think about is that these questions need to really be about deepening their understanding of the text. Because again, the whole point of this is that we have to understand things about polar bears in order for me to then tell them, hey guys, you're gonna do a, um, I want you to analyze this text and tell me what is the descriptive text structures and what did you pull out based on what you've read here? Well, if they don't remember a single thing that they read, how are they gonna go back and start to analyze it even further? And so I'm gonna build in those questions into my lesson itself so that we can have conversations about it. So going back to the transparent, um, the transparent fur, that's when I'm going to ask them, all right, their skin, their white, their fur is not white, but it is what? Transparent making sure that they understand that. Because now the majority of my students should have transparent fur 
on the graphic organizers as they start to analyze it. So everything is connected. It's all very intentional. And I know what you're probably thinking. You're probably saying, wait a second, Bridget, <laughs> does this mean I'm giving them the answers? Yeah, kinda. You're talking them through and you're helping them understand what it is that they're reading so that when they go out to do it on their own, they feel confident and they know the strategies to be thinking about to be able to do it by themselves with a totally different text. That is the entire point. We need to understand what we read in order to be able to dig deeper and analyze. Okay. So if I'm taking these strategies and then I'm building them into a lesson and we've talked about what it could look like between questions, between how do we get kids reading with us and how do we build that active engagement, then what does this actually look like in a specific lesson? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just show you really quick, while there may not be students here responding with me, you get an idea of what this lesson should look like, okay? So here's what I might do. I might say, all right, students, today we're gonna be reading a brand new text. It's called Arctic Wonders, The Magnificent Life of Polar Bears. Guys, what do you think we're gonna be reading about? Uh, everyone? And they're gonna say, polar bears. And I said, great, we are. We're gonna be reading about polar bears today. So I want you to listen as I read this first sentence and then you're gonna echo read it with me, okay? Polar bears are magnificent creatures that live in the cold and icy regions of the Arctic. Everyone echo read, here we go. Are magnificent creatures that live in the cold and icy regions of the Arctic. Wow, where do they live, everyone? The Arctic, fantastic. They live in the Arctic. And so we talked a little bit about the Arctic and where that is located as far as in relation to where we live. And so I want you to be thinking about that so we can start to create some of those connections. Now in this next sentence, what I want you to do is we're gonna read this together, but you're gonna fill in the words for me. Ready? These amazing animals are the land carnivores and they're is not white, but actually, wow. I want you really quick to turn to somebody next to you and tell them what is their fur actually. It's not white, but it's what? And then they're gonna turn and talk. All right, coming back to me in three, two, one. We're reading this one together as an entire group. The next sentence. Underneath, their skin is black, which helps them soak up the warmth from the sun. Huh, I want you to think, why is their skin black again? Turn to somebody, and this time I want our blue partners to go first. So blue partners, tell yellow why, what does the black skin do? Go, and I'm walking around, I'm listening, I'm doing all the things. All right, coming back to me in three, two, one. I heard Josephine say that the black skin helps to soak up warmth from the sun. And that made me think about how sometimes when I walk outside and I'm wearing really dark clothes, like all black, how I feel so much more hot than when I wear clothes that are a lot lighter. What a really great connection there. All right, I want you to listen to me as I read this next sentence. Polar bears are excellent swimmers and can paddle through the freezing waters for long distances. Now I want you to turn with your partner and you're gonna read the next two sentences together in a choral read. And then I might be walking around, listening to them. And so that's kind of the point to it. Notice it's quick. It's not long, but it's because I'm sitting here and I'm prepping and planning with you when it comes to what do I want them really focusing on? What's the objective of my entire lesson? It's that we're thinking about descripting factors here of polar bears. We're learning more about polar bears. We're helping to develop some of those connections and that's the key here. So a lot of those questions are building in, where do they live? What is their fur? Um, what does the black skin do? So all of that is gonna be really important as students start to go in and, and analyze and think a little bit deeper. But again, notice that it was quick and simple. Once you have it planned, you wanna move it quickly. You don't want to have a ton of that droning time where we kind of talk slow. <laughs> 
because then we lose our students and we don't want to do that. So the key here is, is that it's not intended to be complicated or like over the top. It's meant to help keep our students engaged and help them be able to process what they're reading in order to comprehend this text better. So what do you think? Do you feel as though as an upper elementary teacher of fourth, the third through sixth grade, can you possibly incorporate these strategies into your own lessons? I would love it if you would tell me what are some of the strategies you are already using? Maybe what's a strategy that you wanna take back and start to implement into your own classroom? Or even if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those down in the comments. Thank you guys so much for checking out this video. I would love it if you would like, subscribe, and come on back to see more videos about literacy instruction. See you next time.